I'm Vince Swayze. I was born here in the Miramichi in Boystown. The uh, river actually does run through my property, and I've spent most of my life here, a few years away, back and forth. But uh, I returned here in 1961 and stayed, and I've been fishing and guiding for all those years, every year. I remember catching a trout before I was allowed to go to the river by myself. And uh, I caught it on a worm, and it was a good-sized trout. It looked to be about 20 inches long, but I'm sure it was only about 11. And I ran in to show Mother, and she said, what were you doing down at the river by yourself? Well, I got in trouble for, for doing that. So I think I was five, maybe. And from then on, I was supposed to fish with my brother all the time, so my older brother. So that uh, was my life every year. We uh, would sometimes catch more fish than we needed. We'd release them because we got so sick and tired of eating fish when I was young that I didn't want that every day. Wieners was a treat. Oh boy, life on the Miramichi is, uh, it certainly meant a lot to me and I, I guess that's why I've returned to do what I love the most. The river was, uh, was part of my life and every place I ever traveled to, it was great to get back home. It was uh, uh, the fishing, the canoeing, the people that I've met and everything about the salmon fishing industry was was very interesting. The way of life here, but we all, uh, you have to enjoy winter because it's here, but uh, everybody waits for spring and the river to open up, the ice runs, the spring fishing, the, the things that there's an opportunity to do and to boating and canoeing Fishing both trout and, and Atlantic salmon was uh, it's just a unique thing that people come from thousands of miles to do, to do what we do. I guess uh, people are attracted to the Miramichi mainly because of the salmon fishing. There's trout fishing in many areas, but Atlantic salmon is a great attraction all over the world. I've had people from almost, well, from many countries, from far away as Australia, Japan, China, England, of course, and Ireland, and from every state in the Union, and from every province in Canada that come and fished at my place. It is a uh, way of life on the Miramichi is, has changed considerably, and mostly in the last uh, I'm going to say 20 years, probably started a little bit before that, but the shortage of, of Atlantic salmon and the river conditions has just started changing everything. Water, water gets uh, so low in the summer, there's, there, the uh, watershed has been destroyed and the rains uh, run off quickly, the water goes back down and there's a lot of uh, uh, debris and, and sand and, and topsoil and everything else that washes into the river now and settles onto the, the spawning habitat. And I think that has changed completely. The whole way of life and, the, and the, everything on the Miramichi is changing in the last, and more so in the last 10 years than the last 20, but it started at least 20 years ago. It's important to protect the Miramichi way of life, I believe. The, the industry itself in, in the uh, sport fishing industry, the, uh, the work that it has made, and I think at one time was bigger on the Miramichi than the lumber industry is today on the Miramichi. Because there was many, many people, there was camps along the river up our way, uh, from spring, we'd start in the spring on, in April, about April 15th, if the ice was out of the river, 
Clayton and Stewart would have 20 fishermen, I'd have 15. There was a camp, Kenmore, they used to run 12 to 15 fishermen. And uh, Murray Calhoun's camp ran a lot of fishermen in the spring. Um, Elder Bailey's camp, Wilson's, and down, of course, through, through uh, Carroll's Crossing, Dope Town, all the way down Blissfield. There was a, a lot of fishing camps, and every fisherman had a guide. It would last probably, the most I guided in any one spring was 37 consecutive days. It were, and there was many others that were doing just as many as, as I had. I guess you'd have to say government would be the only ones who could protect the, uh, the uh, way of life and the river by making some regulations in, uh, in how the watershed is, is being destroyed. Um, I, I think that lumbering could have continued to be done without destroying the watershed and, and left at least buffer zones save the hardwood, stop the herbicide spraying. And governments are the only one people that can do that. Uh, uh, herbicides has been banned in many provinces and in many states. Uh, they must know why. Uh, we should have a study done on this river to find out what effect it, it has had on the habitat, both spawning and, and uh, rocks are uh, and the spawning area is embedded now in mud and sand that's just, uh, it's almost discouraging to look at it. Places where I used to watch salmon spawn, they, they couldn't spawn there anymore. I guess way of life on the Miramichi just, it totally changed. I think it was a, a very, certainly was a very important part of my life. And growing up, it's changing rapidly and a lot of the younger people don't get involved in it like we used to. And of course, a lot of the younger people don't stay here anymore. There's, uh, I, I think there was enough, uh, enough work in the area at one time that it kept a lot of our young people here. And uh, now that everything has changed and salmon are not totally gone, but uh, certainly much scarcer than they, they were in the past, the salmon angling was very important to the economy along the river. There was many, many jobs created. At one time on this river, when we were lobbying to get the commercial fishery stopped, there was uh, some 300 jobs here in the southwest. And that, that was a big industry for, from the, the head of the settlement at Hayesville or up to Rocky Brook, we'll say, to the tide wave. Was, uh, there was a lot of jobs created. Every fisherman come in had to have a guide. They ran camp, served meals. Uh, and the, uh, the people, the towns, the, the stores, the uh, gas stations, everybody notices the difference today from what it used to be. And there was a lot of people around all summer, uh, a lot of uh, non-resident cars and uh, Many of the people at gas stations just can't believe it now, the changes that's, that has occurred over those years. The, the impact of the salmon totally disappearing here, it, well, it's been affected so much already, uh, it would totally change what's left um, in a way that, you know, people wouldn't come here to visit anymore. There isn't, uh, there isn't really things left to see like there used to be. I've, uh, I've taken people when the fishing wasn't good on canoe trips, wilderness canoe trips, like on the Canes or on the Dungarvan, the Renews, some of those rivers, just a trip. When the water dropped enough, we'd go back to, to salmon fishing. But uh, they talked as much about those things as uh, they did about their, their fishing trip. It was people that live in, in big cities in the U.S. doesn't have those things to do unless they come to a place like this. And with that gone, and we can't take people canoeing today except the day after a rain. When, when the water comes up one day, down the next, and uh, 
we can't blame that on climate change alone. Tourism has been a very important thing on the Miramichi River here. There was, there was people here continuously. I used to run two camps. One was a company camp plus my own place. And I'd bring in uh, about 18 guests per week, those two camps. And I was busy every week of the summer. I employed up to 17 people between the two places and, and worked many hours a day myself, besides that. And uh, <clears throat> this has been totally affected those camps today. One of them has two employees, and I think the other camp has, I'm going to say four. When I was there last year, there was four people working there. Tourists are number one when they come to the Miramichi or looking at salmon fishing. There are other things that can be done. And uh, we've always tried to do that, to go to look at, uh, at things like Fallbrook Falls or drive into the barrier pools and just show people around the area, do, uh, do canoeing, do, do things that uh, you think that people will enjoy. And they, they usually do enjoy it. But without the salmon, I, I don't think we get a lot of those people coming here for what's, uh, what, what, what the other things we have to offer. There are many threats to the, to the uh, salmon population. And I could start at the sea and work up river, or I'll start at the headwaters and work down. Is the, uh, the watershed being destroyed? Uh, the water warming up in the river, which isn't all caused from global warming. Uh, the uh, the uh, problem with the, uh, the spawning grounds, what's happening to it, how the rocks are embedded in the river. Uh, the predators, uh, striped bass is a, a serious problem and government doesn't seem to want to do anything about that. Uh, Seals, I believe, are our problem. Uh, one time we blamed uh, mergansers for being a problem, but they were always here. And, and uh, there were plenty of, uh, of par, which they attack. But, uh, uh, and commercial fishing, of course, has some effect, I'm sure. And w one time, <coughs> poaching was a serious problem. Uh, it's probably still fairly serious for the amount of fish we have. <coughs> Excuse me. We have uh, very few wardens on the river anymore. The few wardens there are, and the provincial wardens, is chasing people on, uh, on ATVs for not having a helmet on and that sort of thing. Not protecting the fish like they used to do. Uh, poachers... Uh, can watch where they are pretty well and uh, go out and poach whenever they feel like it. It's, it's just almost an open season. I think if governments would, uh, would begin very quickly, they could save the salmon in the Miramichi. Uh, there has to be some things looked at and they have to listen to many of the people who, who are on the Miramichi and knows what the, what the problems are even if I'm sure I don't know them all, but I know a lot of them, but you put a lot of us together and we would know most of them. I've been involved in, uh, in conservation organizations for many years, the Miramichi Salmon Association. I think I've been a director for some 42 years or something on that. I'm still on that board. I've been on the watershed management group since uh, it originated in the early 90s and been a member of the uh, New Brunswick Salmon Council for several years, had been, uh, and of course members of uh, many other uh, conservation organizations that have been involved. There's, uh, I think in the past, we have tried and did do some many good things by lobbying, by doing things that uh, that was going to help the river. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. 
And if conservation organizations could put more pressure on government somehow to do the things that needs to be, be done, I think would help a lot. Because governments are really the only ones can change it. We can make all kinds of recommendations if they don't do it, but if we put enough pressure on, I think down the road that uh, they should, if they have any interest, they should be able to do something about it. I've fished <coughs> with many people and, and outfitted many people for salmon fishing and, uh, and some very well-known ones. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of days fishing with Ted Williams, who everybody knew was a ball player. I used to have uh, uh, quite a few of the New Jersey Devil players come up here and, uh, and fished with them, the, a lot of them well-known. Uh, we didn't get a lot of ball players because the fishing season and the, and the baseball season kind of was the same time. So, um, a few movie actors, William Hurt fished with me many times. Uh, I had Henry Ford booked once to fish, uh, but he had to cancel. And I also had John Wayne booked and he had to cancel. So I never did a, get an opportunity to meet John Wayne or fish with him. But would have been an interesting, very interesting for me had that happened. Uh, there are many other CEOs of large companies that, uh, that I've entertained and a lot of their, their high level people that, that have very important jobs in the US. Uh, a few politicians, John Fraser, when he was Minister of Fisheries and then Speaker of the House, he fished with me a lot of times. And uh, I think he did salmon a lot of good when he was Minister of Fisheries too. He was responsible for stopping the, the offshore Canadian uh, uh, commercial fishery. And we thought that was going to be the answer until the other problems popped up following that. So, and no matter what anybody does, the problems doesn't end, they just keep coming. I've had some very interesting things that that happened fishing. And there's a lot of stories to be told. Some can be embellished to make them more interesting. But of course, I wouldn't do that. Uh, it'd be true, true stories only. Uh, but once, when I was very young, there was a couple of fellows come in to my father. My father was running the place. I was nine years old. And they said, where do we fish? Well, <clears throat> back in those years, they didn't, uh, weren't required to have a licensed guide or anything. And he said, all oh, the young fellow will show you. So he called me in and, and uh, asked me to show them where to fish. So I put them in a boat, pulled them across to Island Pool, and they uh, start fishing. And one fellow hooked a salmon. And uh, I ran and got the net and come up and placed the net in the, in the river. I did know how to, how to net a fish, but they didn't believe it. So the other fellow, he quit fishing and come down and took the net. He said, I better do that. Said, okay. So he chased the fish all over the pool and swiped at it I don't know how many times and finally hit the leader and broke it. So the salmon was gone. And soon they got back fishing. He hooks a fish, the net man. He hooks a fish. And same thing, I got the net. Second guy comes and thought, he better net it. He did the exact same thing. He hit the leader and, and uh, broke it, and that salmon was gone. And I don't know to this day if he did that to get even or if neither one of them knew anything about netting a fish. But, but there, there were many interesting things, and of course, I learned from everybody. I tried to learn something from everybody that I fished with. And in the beginning as a guide, which I guide regular in the summer when I was 13 and 14 years old, I'd be guiding every day. And, and uh, I learned a lot about casting and, and fishing and tying knots and different flies. And back in those years, the, the classics were the main flies that uh, you would use, you know, the Jock Scott, the Silver Doctor, Silver Gray, and that type of type of thing, there was many of them. 
but most of the Miramichi people couldn't afford to pay a dollar for a fly, so they began tying uh, their own out of uh, any kind of hair, from calf's hair and dog hair, or squirrel tails and that sort of thing. And they were just as effective as the, as the classics. Uh, I remember an occasion of, of making six casts once in the summer in July and getting four fish on four different rods for four different people. And I passed the, I made one cast for one fellow and passed him a rod back. I, uh, the other fellow called me, he said, do that for me. I made one cast and I hooked a fish for him and he brought it in. The third fellow wanted me to take his rod and I said, I'll be right back. So I went up to the cabin and I come back. And he said, okay, it's my turn. And I was hoping that he would move down a little while I was gone really, to get in the best spot. And I made two casts, got a fish, gave him the rod. The next fellow wanted me to do it for him. So I made two casts with him and caught a fish. So they had their four fish. The fifth fellow asked me if I would hook one for him. And I said, look, I'll have to do it tomorrow because four fish is the limit for anybody. So, so I, I pleased four of them. Probably the next day I got one for each of the others. I'm not sure. Right out in front of the house at, uh, at my home. We'd fish there in a, what we call camp pool today. And, uh, and it was a grills, but I got it on a worm. And uh, was really fishing for trout. And in those years, we had no, no equipment. You'd have a line wound on the end of a, an alder pole and, and cast it. So to get something uh, the size of a grills, you had to quickly get the half hitch off the end and kind of hold it so it would spin out. And then when you got enough line out, you fought it by hand, not on a reel. So uh, there was many of those fish that were lost, of course, but I finally got one in and I was probably seven years old at that time and only had a couple of years experience at fishing. The biggest one I caught myself was about 26 pounds. I never got one bigger than that. Uh, I I've guided many people that caught them in the 30s. And most of those big fish in my career as a guide was after the commercial fishery stopped in 1984. 83 was the last year for commercial fishery. So we had a lot of good sized salmon in this river. Prior to that, the Miramichi was labeled the Grills River. But, uh, the, uh, the big salmon were coming back to the river. And at one time, many years ago, I used to hear stories of uh, fish being in the 30 pounds, but I hadn't seen one for a lot of years until, until uh, I'd never seen one until into the 80s, 90s. And we had some big fish. We caught nine fish one September at my camp that were over 30 pounds. So forget which year that was, maybe 90, 93 was a great year. It might've been that year. We had a lot of big fish. Life on, <coughs> life on the Miramichi. If I, of course I have to go back, I can't go into the future, but, but uh, it's been wonderful to have lived here for my years. I've, uh, I don't know where I could have gone or what I could have done in a way of life to have enjoyed it any more than what I have did for a living. And there was a lot of long days and there was a lot of bad years, but mostly they were all good years in the, in the end. I, I was able to uh, work from the 15th of April through the 15th of October. I spent a lot of time on the river and uh, I met a lot of great people in those years. Many of them, of them are gone now, but 
we still have stories that uh, we talk about with their friends who've returned. I've had a lot of people that fished at my camp for 45 years. Some of them. I lost a, a customer last year who come here first in the 60s and he the last 25 years he come twice a year come in July and again in September so I had many people that are, were repeats they returned they loved it here and uh, some of them now are too old to fish and uh, you know, of course they're not as old as I am but I <laughs> they believe they're too old I think like it most of us, most of the camps here make people very welcome and do things with them and get to know them well. I always found it very important to mix with the, with the guests. And when you mix with them, uh, you get to know them very well. And especially if you, if you have the opportunity to, to guide like I did. That was the best part of running camps to me was the guiding. I, uh, it made my days a lot longer, but I got to know the people very well and made many good friends while I was doing it. And most of the camps along the river, uh, people returned to year after year. And sometimes you'd get people that were at somebody else's camp because they couldn't take them or, or they caught no fish and they heard that the fish was, fishing was better someplace else. And of course, there's uh, certain times during the season that fishing is better at one camp than it is the other, or the next week it might be better at, at a different camp, so, depending on where the fish are. For a newcomer to catch a salmon, it was always very exciting for me. I, I would rush toward them to make sure they didn't hold on to the reel or the line and to try to help them uh, keep the rod, keep the tip up, let the fish go. The first few minutes always belongs to the fish. And uh, it was always very exciting to see the reaction of, of those people. If, if you could prevent them from making a mistake by not holding the, the line and breaking the lead or losing the fish, it, uh, and once they settle down and you could help them and get it in, why those people were, that was a moment they never forgot, I'm sure. And for many years, they'd talk about that first fish. And so it was always exciting to me as a guide to, to see those people do it. And the most important thing, of course, was to see the, the guests catch fish, not, uh, not the guide catch them and pass the rod. That was... That was all right for the first one, and then you could, but after that, it was most enjoyable to see the guests catch their own fish. I'm hopeful that, that there can be enough things done, if they're done soon, to keep the salmon coming into the Miramichi. I, I think they can still be saved uh, by doing the right things. Uh, no kill right now is very important. I'd love to see it come back to where we could keep a fish a day, uh, grills or a salmon. And uh, a lot of things governments could do, like in the spring, we have to, when the water's high and cold, fish are tough, we have to use a pinched barb. In the summer, fishing in warm water, you can use a double hook with barb which is totally ridiculous. It, uh, at one time, I'd catch maybe, I'd average 12 par an hour fishing, unless I put on a huge fly, that the big bomber or something they couldn't get a hold of. And you can't release a par without damaging it with a barbed hook. With a barbless hook or pinched barb, you can barely get them out of the water to your hand. They flip and get off. And why that isn't a regulation, I don't know. Um, a lot of people believe the barb was put on 
the hook to keep the fish on, which it had nothing to do with. I flossed them with double hooks with barbs, with single hooks with barbs, with pinch barbs, and you still lose some of them. You're lucky if you can land 50% of what you hook. And so many things could be done to, to keep the fish in the river, but we got to look after habitat, I think, is the number one thing to start on so that those fish can still produce and survive to make it back to sea. If, <clears throat> if we could get the river back to what it used to be, an awful lot of young people are interested in canoeing and tubing and seeing the river. Well, of course, to do those things, you've got to have pretty decent weather. And uh, this summer and many of the summers in the past, during that vacation time, people, they couldn't canoe because the water gets so low now compared with what it used to be. It's, a canoe was just baggage to go down river. Right now, if you took a canoe trip, you'd drag the canoe most of the time. It, so if something could be done to save the watershed it could be uh, very, very important. And that's just, just the river. To, and of course, to save the watershed, we could improve the habitat again, and I, I think would make all the difference in the world. The other things could be, could be done so that people could catch, and many young people especially likes to keep fish, if they could go to the tideway and catch, uh, catch stripers and keep one, that's fine. Striped bass is very good, uh, very good eating fish. And there's many of them, hundreds of thousands of them, which we don't need that many. And that's where the harvest should commence, not right away start killing salmon again, because they're still too scarce. A few years back, I, I went to a fundraiser auction, and I bought a a rod and reel line. And it was a nice fishing outfit. And we went to Rocky Brook, fished it to both the sisters. Mark Hambrook was on one side of the pool and I on the other. And there were some people at the next pool down we called to. And there was a guide. And, and uh, I started fishing, and the reel was was a left-hand wine, and the line was put on right-handed. So it was really backwards to the way the drag was. So I talked to Mark, and he said, well, I don't know, it come that way, and nobody checked it. So I said, oh, well. So I cut my fly off, stripped out all the line, let it go down through the pool, turned the reel, and reversed it, and wound it all on uh, left-hand wine. And I got into the casting line, all the backing was back on, and it tightened up. But I first thought I got hooked around a rock, so I gave it a couple of pulls, and a salmon jumped. Mark said, that looked like your line. Well, knowing then there was something on there, I said, yeah, I got a salmon on. He said, how could you have a, a salmon on with no fly. Well, the, the, when the fish jumped or the line hit it, it was wrapped around the mouth of the fish, the line went in there and looped, it was half hitched around the bottom jaw like that. And about 30 to 40 feet of line dragging behind it. The fish jumped seven times, we got it ashore, and by that time there was about six other witnesses who couldn't believe this could happen. And, and uh, so I did prove that you don't need a barb, you don't need a hook. All you need is to be darn lucky. <laughs> many, <clears throat> many times when I was a lot younger, I used to do that um, trip from Half Moon all the way down to Voice Town or sometimes down part way to. And I was 
guiding Bud Bird down the river. And of course, it makes it much easier when the water isn't high to be standing up to read the water on, on where to go. And I got to Burn Hill uh, Rapids and very rough. And there's a spot where you have, right at the top of it, you have to snub your canoe and kind of wait till that hole fills in with water and then let it go. So I held the canoe long enough and went to pull the pole and the pole was caught. The canoe started and it pulled me out of the canoe. So the pole stood straight up and I just wrapped my legs and hung on like that and I'm two feet above the water and the way the canoe goes and my guest in it down through the rapids all the way down through Burnt Hill and Merlin Palmer was behind another guide with a guest. He snubbed his canoe and I jumped in his canoe and didn't even have my sneakers wet. He caught up to my canoe down below about nearly a hundred yards and I stepped back in it. Bud turned around and looked at me and he said, I've made a lot of trips down the river with Clayton, some of Clayton Stewart's best guides and you're the only man that ever brought me through Burnt Hill Rapids and never hit a rock. Of course, he didn't know I was even out of the canoe. But <laughs> and John Wayne, he had got called back to Hollywood right at the time. He was in New York when he was planning on coming up here on the company airplane. And it all changed, something changed, so he couldn't make it. <laughs>